많이 알게 됐고 그러니까 말만 듣다가 영화로 보니까 이게 더 많이 알게 되고 네, 역사와 접목해서 유대인에 대한 잘못된 오해 같은 것들이 어, 영화와 함께 감독님의 강의가 너무 좋았고 며칠 동안 강의를 들으면서 그동안 알지 못했던 새로운 것도 많이 알수 있어서 굉장히 감사한 시간이었고 주변에 어, 제가 배운 내용을 모르는 사람들에게 배운 것을 또 알려주고 기회만 된다 그러면 은 같이 참여하고 싶고 같이 오고 싶습니다. 혼자만 알기가 너무 아깝고 많은 분들과 공유하고 싶은 그런 책임감, 사명감까지 느껴집니다. Shalom, my name is Joseph Shulam and in partnership with Brad TV in Korea, we are doing the weekly portions of the Torah that are being read in every synagogue and today, just before Shabbat, we are going to do Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 18 to chapter 21 verse 9. The portion is called Judges, not the book of Judges. The Torah portion judges from Deuteronomy 16.18 to 21.9. Now, let me give you a little bit of historical background. The book of Judges, the, the, the date that is the last possible date for this book is from the 7th century BC, during the reign of King Josiah. Josiah reigned from 640 B.C. to 609 B.C. And during his time, there was the biggest religious reformation in Israel. Ancient institutions were changed. Ancient offices around the temple and in the worship of the Israelites were changed. There was a centralization of the worship in Jerusalem. What do I mean by centralization? Before Josiah, every village had a priest, and every priest had an altar, and every altar there was a possibility of offering. People didn't have to travel a long way to Jerusalem from the Galilee or from the Negev or from Beersheba. Uh, in order to worship God and in order to uh, offer sacrifices to God. We have the story of the judges like Gideon from Ofra in Samaria that had an altar there and offered sacrifices there. We had Elijah uh, not too long before uh, Josiah in the days of Ahab that made an altar on Mount Carmel and offered an offering to the Lord there. And we have many, many examples of Abraham and, and the, our fathers, Isaac and Jacob, that made altars all over the land and offered all over the land. And we have archaeological evidence of such altars in Arad and in uh, Megiddo and in Hazor and in other places where Israelites, before the the time of Josiah before the 7th century BC had high places, altars, temples all over the land. Josiah centralized the worship in Jerusalem for political and I think spiritual reasons because almost in all the other places that archaeologists dug, they found also side by side with altars to the Lord, God of Israel, the Almighty, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, also syncretism, idols, household idols were found in, in Israelite houses 
even in Jerusalem and close to Jerusalem. So Josiah's centralization is based on the book of Deuteronomy. But this week's portion that is called Judges, Shoftim, is very, very special. What is special about it? We have ancient codices of law, like the law of Hammurabi. That is, hundreds of years precedes uh, Josiah and even Abraham. We have the Umnamu Code of Law, also found in Babylon, that is even earlier than the Code of Hammurabi. But we don't have in any of the codes of law or documents of the ancient world what we read here in this portion of the law of Moses. Let me read to you the first verses of our Torah portion. Deuteronomy chapter 16, I'm starting in verse 18. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which means all your cities, which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment, righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take bribe, for bribes blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Let me stop here in verse 20. Four verses of great importance. What's the importance of these verses? That the book of Deuteronomy, which we believe was given by God from the Holy Spirit to the children of Israel, maybe much earlier than Josiah, maybe much earlier than the 7th century BC, maybe even written by Moses, but not published until the days of Josiah. Today in Israel, a democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East, the only democracy among all the Arab countries around us, such a democracy that in the last three years we had four elections and before the three years are over, we'll have five elections. I, you could say that's a democracy going to seed. You could say that's a democracy that is vibrant. You could say that this is crazy, but it is a democracy. But I can't say that what God commands here in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 16 is alive and well and being practiced in my country, in the country of Israel. We have had the minister of finance in jail. We've had the president in jail. We've had the minister of religion in jail. We had the minister of interior affairs in jail. Right now, we even have a prime minister that is accused of, being, of taking bribes and he's in court. And I hope that he didn't take bribes and I hope he doesn't get convicted. But the very strong proclamation of the law of God in the book of Deuteronomy that says, don't give bribes, don't take bribes, because bribes blind the eyes of the wise and twist the words of the righteous. Inherit. The land is dependent on our, the purity of our hands, of the righteousness of our heart, of our desire to do right and truth 
and judge. This is what the word of God commands us as the children of God to make our countries blessed by the Almighty God. Justice and righteousness in the land. Verse 1 of chapter 17, another one of these monumental commands that the law of God gives us. You shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God a bull or a sheep which has any blemish or defect, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. Think about this. When you give something to the Lord, whether it's your tithes on Sunday morning, in an envelope or without an envelope or in a basket or in a plate that is passed from one another in the, through the pews, however you give, what you give, even if it's money, it has to be clean money. It has to be money you earned with the sweat of your brow. It has to be pure because God will not accept any gifts, any tithes, any charity that is blemished. When there was sacrifices in the temple, the priest checked every sheep, every goat, every calf, every cow, every bird to find out if it was healthy or not, if it had a blemish or not, if it was a blind goat it was rejected if it was a goat that had a blemish in his leg it was rejected it had to be a perfect animal our lives and our contributions to the lord based on these commands in the law of moses also have to be pure also have to be sincere because if our giving is not sincere, it's blemished. It's blemished. And the Torah is so clear about these things. There's so much written in the Torah about this concept. Dear brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. I didn't write it. And Martin Luther didn't write it. John Calvin didn't write it. And John Wellesley didn't write it. And the Pope in Rome didn't write it. This is the word of God delivered to Moses in Mount Sinai. And I said that the finished work of the book of Deuteronomy, the latest possible date is 7th century BC. And these commands are so Simple. In my, in my opinion, they're simple. They're hard to practice, but they're simple. And nobody in his right mind will oppose them. Nobody will say, okay, let's give God a blemished sacrifice. Ah, this goat is sick. Why don't we just give it to God and get double benefit? No, you're not going to get double benefit because God knows everything. What's in your heart? Before you open your mouth and say your words, God has already read them in your heart, in my heart, in our heart. Another thing that appears in our reading is how do you deal with problems that arise in judgment before the judges, before the, the officers of the court that are not so simple to resolve. Here, chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, verse 8. If a matter arises which is too hard for you to judge between decrees of guilt for bloodshed, between one judgment or another, or between punishment or, or another, matters of controversy which your gate, with, with matters of controversy within your gates, then you shall arise and go up to the place of the Lord your God chooses. And you shall come to the priest and the Levites. And to the judge there is there in your days. And inquire of them. They shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment. 
you shall do according to the sentence which is pronounced upon you in the place of the Lord chooses, and you shall be careful to do according to all that they order you. Okay, you're a judge, you're an officer of the court, a case comes before you very complicated, and you can't make up your mind to the right or to the left. You have another higher station to take your judgment to, and that is in the house of the Lord himself with the priests and with the Levites and the judges that are there in your day. And you bring your case before them and you together with them will deliberate and weigh and decide. And whatever you come to conclusion, the judgment that you jointly in the house of the Lord come to conclusion, you will observe and you have to keep it. Arbitration from the divine seat of worship of God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the one place in Jerusalem. By the way, the, the, the phrases here in verse 10 of chapter 17 is very important. Why? Because Yeshua uses it, the same phrase, according to all they order you. The last phrase of verse 10 in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Yeshua uses it in Matthew chapter 23. The first verses when he talks about the Pharisees and says the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Whatever they order you, you listen to it. You observe it. That is in a case like we have here in the text of Deuteronomy. If you don't know what to do, you read the law and you don't know how to slaughter a sheep carefully so that it bleeds. If you go to the Pharisees, when we had Pharisees, God says through Yeshua to his disciples and to people who are around him at that time, if you go to them, they sit on the seat of Moses. They have the authority to interpret the law, not the prophets, and not the writings, and not the Song of Songs, the law of God means Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They sit on the seat of Moses, they have the right to, but if you don't have an answer, you want to know something, you go to them, and if you ask them to arbitrate for you, whatever they decide, you're obligated to observe. That's taken right here from verse 10, of our chapter chapter 17 of the book of Deuteronomy. Whatever they sentence you, decision, interpretation of the law, they are sitting in the seat of Moses according to Yeshua and you are asking them to interpret the law for you and when they do, you automatically agree to observe. It's all in this portion of the Torah. There is some other things that I want to share with you quickly from Deuteronomy. And I will go to chapter 19 of the book of Deuteronomy. It's still within our Torah reading of this week. Chapter 19 of Deuteronomy, verse 1. When the Lord your God has cut off the nations whose land the Lord your God has given you, and you dispossess them and dwell in their cities and in their houses, you shall separate three cities for yourself in the midst of your land, which the Lord your God is giving you to possess you shall prepare roads for yourselves, divide into three parts the territory 
is talking about the cities of refuge. The cities of refuge. God had the foresight, had the foreknowledge of what is going to happen in the court cases in your land. The courts cannot always discern between right and wrong who did and why they did and how they did to seemingly break the law. But for those people who didn't do something on purpose, preordained by them, planned by them, executed by them, but did mistakes. And the courts can't decide between a mistake that was done in good faith, in good intention, and accidental from somebody who planned a heist on purpose and killed people during a bank robbery. Yeah. Then there is a city of refuge, three cities of refuge on this side of the Jordan River, three cities of refuge on the other side of the Jordan River, and the person who by mistake killed somebody, by mistake ran over somebody, and is not intentionally guilty, God provided a city of refuge, and the people that were in the city of refuge stayed there, ate there, worked there, lived there, and when the high priest dies, the city of refuge empties and everybody is no longer guilty and nobody has a right to touch them. That's wonderful. Wonderful system of supreme justice. Reading the people's intention of their hearts. And God's grace provides for them that when the high priest dies, they are free of guilt and free in society. Nobody can touch them. This is a very important example because it is an example of how a death of a high priest atones for people's mistakes. That's a pattern that is fulfilled ultimately for all mankind in Yeshua, who in his house we find a city of refuge. And we should appreciate our fellowships, our churches, our communities as cities of refuge for the innocent who made mistakes and accept them with open arms because our high priest died for all of us until the end of time when he returns to Zion in glory. Hallelujah. God bless you all.